This video is going to discuss things that patients and physicians can do to prevent or delay the onset of significant coronary artery disease, as well as once patients have established coronary disease, the best ways to manage those people so that they can stay healthy. Prevention is key. If we can prevent people from ending up with blockages in their arteries, that in turn prevents damage to the heart muscle. A separate series of lectures I'm going to talk about congestive heart failure, and the most common cause of that are blockages in the arteries or coronary artery disease. So what can a patient do to prevent themselves from ending up in my practice having an angiogram or needing a stent or bypass surgery? From a patient end, the most important thing is diet, exercise, and weight. Very simple to say, very simple to do, but people can dedicate the time, but it has to be something which is done on a consistent basis, not go on a diet for a week or two weeks. This goes to lifestyle changes in how someone wants to live their life or do what they want to do, but then end up having problems like we talked about. So I'll break them down a little bit. Diet is complex and there's separate lectures that I've discussed dietary modifications, but as far as blockages in the arteries, that's mostly due to high cholesterol and high cholesterol in diet is affected by saturated fat. So limiting the saturated fat to 10 grams at most on a given day, or if someone can stay under five grams, that would be even better. Exercise is key. And exercise doesn't mean, well, twice a month I went and did something. People need to do regular exercise, either every day or most days of the week. There is no one set exercise that's better than another exercise. It should be something that patients don't mind doing because if you force a patient to do something they don't like to do, they won't do that for 50 years or they'll resent you for 50 years. So they have to find something they like to do and this way they don't mind doing it and they're more likely to do it. Also has to be something that patients are able to do. As patients get older, they develop more orthopedic issues. People with bad knees can't run 45 minutes every day and perhaps a bicycle would be a better idea. But exercise is both key at decreasing the plaque that builds up in the arteries. Exercise is better than medication at preventing the onset of diabetes. And exercise is also the best way of giving cardiologists a warning mechanism in patients if they develop coronary artery disease. Each year in the northern climates, or if somebody's viewing this in the southern hemisphere in the far southern climates, in their winter, when it snows, you hear in the news the next morning after the snow that somebody died shoveling snow and the wife found the husband on the driveway. It's not one person that dies. There are hundreds of people that die the first snowfall from shoveling. Shoveling is great exercise, but the problem is if somebody shovels snow in the winter months and then sits on their butt and does nothing as far as activity, until the winter season starts again, and then they shovel snow. Shoveling is very vigorous exercise, like running wind sprints. It's great exercise, but once you do something that vigorously, the demand for blood flow of the heart goes up significantly. If that demand exceeds the supply and people continue doing it, that can trigger heart attacks, which in turn can cause sudden death. If that person had done regular exercise from last winter over the next 10 months until the current winter, at some point during that 10 month period, they most likely would have developed some symptoms that occur with exertion. People who exercise on a regular basis like me, every now and then notice twinges or aches or pains one day and they're fine the next day. If it goes away and it's not recurrent, it's unlikely to be a heart related issue. But if somebody's doing their regular exercise and for the second, third or fourth day, they realize 20 minutes in or 30 minutes in, they're getting a discomfort, a lot of patients say, what am I supposed to look out for? It could be anything. Women oftentimes have more atypical symptoms than men, but men also can develop atypical symptoms. It doesn't have to be an elephant was sitting on a chest or a bear was hugging my chest. I've had people come in with jaw pain thinking that they needed a tooth taken care of. Neck pain, shoulder pain, arm pain, chest discomfort, just profuse sweating more so than what they would expect if they're working out outside. But any of those symptoms, if that occurs with exertion, you need to rest to make it go away, and it happens a second, third, or a fourth time, that's enough of a warning to say, I need to contact my physician, let my physician know what's happening, and in that stand, if the physician's concerned based on your age and risk factors, usually that will lead to either a stress test or an angiogram, depending on how concerned we are about the symptoms. In that case, if we do a stress test and the stress test is abnormal, that would lead to an angiogram. The angiogram would most likely find a blockage. We could put a stent in the artery and fix that blockage. And then that same patient would be out in November shoveling snow, 
completely asymptomatic, getting really good exercise shoveling snow, and his wife wouldn't find him dead on the driveway. So exercise not only decreases the development of diabetes, which is a significant risk factor for coronary disease, increasing your risk four to eightfold over a patient who doesn't have diabetes, it also decreases your cholesterol, it decreases blood pressure, and provides a warning mechanism as to if people are developing coronary artery disease so it can be fixed at a stage before it ends up causing a problem. Physicians will often look at risk factors. You can look at someone whose visual appearance is like mine, has a normal body mass index, but has a sky high cholesterol. In a part, that could be genetics. So just because someone looks good on the outside doesn't mean that they can't have abnormalities on the inside. So at some point in an early adult life, patients should have at least their cholesterol and glucose checked once, and then based on what those numbers are, at some periodic interval to follow. Cholesterol, unless weight or diet changes, is unlikely to change over time. Glucose or development of diabetes can change over time even if people don't gain a good amount of weight. So that is something that should be checked on a periodic basis. If the cholesterol is high, the earlier we treat someone's cholesterol, the less plaque they build up over their lifetime. If someone has diabetes, the better the diabetes is controlled, whether it's a parameter called hemoglobin A1C, which is an average blood sugar, or what we call time to therapeutic range, which patients have glucose monitors, and we can determine how much of the 24-hour period they stay within the therapeutic range. Both are very good monitors of diabetes, but the better the diabetes is controlled, the less likely people are to develop coronary disease. If somebody's body mass index, a normal range is 18 to 25, if the body mass index is over 25, especially if it's over 30 or 35, getting weight down is not only key to preventing the onset of diabetes, as I've said in the lifestyle lecture, you don't get diabetes because you eat sugar, you get diabetes from being overweight for too long. So getting the weight down will decrease the development of diabetes. If you are a diabetic and your body mass index is high, as long as your pancreas hasn't burnt out, you can cure yourself of diabetes if you get enough exercise and get your weight down to a normal range. Some of those people may no longer be diabetic. Once again, bringing the importance of exercise and diet. We have medications, however, that'll treat diabetes. Some of the medications for diabetes now are very good for cardiac patients and patients that have blockages in the arteries around the heart. Unfortunately, some of the medications are injections. It's not an injection like insulin that you have to do four times a day. It's once a week or so, but those injections are not only very good at improving weight, improving A1C, they also decrease the risk of heart disease. So yes, older diabetic medications, if you've read, can increase your risk of heart disease and aren't always good for heart patients. Some of the newer drugs, there's a class called GLPs, are very good for patients with coronary artery disease. I hope you found this lecture helpful. If you have any questions, post it in the comments. Have a good afternoon.